Would you pray with me as we begin? God, we thank you again that we get to gather together as your people, that we get to hear from your word, that we get to worship you together. We thank you that you have called us out of darkness into light. We thank you for salvation that we have in Christ and the fellowship that we have with one another because of his blood shed for us. So I pray that we would just be teachable today, we would be humble, and that we would walk in a manner uh, pleasing to you, just in our thoughts and our actions and our words this morning. Pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So as we've been thinking about uh, evangelism the last several weeks, uh, there's one passage that I often come back to as I think about evangelistic conversations, as I think about preaching the gospel. Uh, one passage that's just so helpful as we think about evangelism, and the reason recently that I thought of this passage was because of a conversation with my five-year-old. A five-year-old son uh, at bedtime, I don't know if, if any of you have kids that do this, but at bedtime is when they ask the questions about life and death and about Jesus. And it usually works to extend bedtime because I'm willing to have those conversations. So my five-year-old is asking about how does he get into heaven? How do you go to heaven again? What do I have to do? What do I have to believe? So we're talking about faith in Jesus. And he says to me, okay, so what, what do I have to pray exactly? What do I have to say to Jesus? I'm like, buddy, you have to believe Jesus. And he's like, okay, okay. So what do I say? What do I pray? What do I, what do, I do here? And uh, ultimately, the conversation led to me telling him, uh, you know, buddy, you, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must have God do something to you that you cannot do for yourself. It's not a checklist. It's not a prayer that you pray. God has to change you on the inside so that you can believe. So it's going to take us to our passage. I'm sure you know where we're going. John chapter 3. Jesus command to be born again. And this is the evangelism from Jesus himself, Jesus' evangelistic command. So we're going to see how Jesus pursues evangelism with Nicodemus, what he says, what he commands him to do. So we're going to go through this passage together. We're going to look at verses 1 through 21 this morning and see the unfolding of Jesus' evangelism, the unfolding of his evangelistic command to be born again. So if you would turn to John chapter 3. We're just going to work through this one section at a time, broken this up into six, six sections so we can see what Jesus is doing here as he brings the gospel to Nicodemus. So if you would read with me, John 3, verses 1 through 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So right off the bat, we see Jesus bringing Nicodemus to, to the first section here, the, the inability of man, the inability of man. We are introduced here immediately to, to Nicodemus, who is called a Pharisee. Uh, he's a ruler of Pharisees. The Pharisees are the, the interpreters of the law, the religious leaders, uh, giving both civil and religi religious leadership to the people. We know the Pharisees, right? The self-righteous ones that Jesus condemns, the ones who, who want to kill Jesus, who hand him over to be killed. But here, there's not hostility. There's just a conversation. Nicodemus doesn't come with hostility. He just comes to have a collegial conversation he comes at night, it says. Maybe this is fear of being seen. Maybe it's just the only time that Jesus can have an extended conversation. He wants to have a dialogue with Jesus. And he comes respectfully, calls Jesus a rabbi, a teacher. He says he's a teacher from God. It seems like Nicodemus here wants to have a conversation as one teacher to another. Nicodemus being a teacher, Jesus being a teacher. Let's just have a dialogue about some things, about the Bible, about the Torah. And Nicodemus acknowledges that Jesus is doing miracles. He says he sees the signs that he is doing. So there's acknowledgement that he, he must have some truth from God. He's doing miracles. 
So now Nicodemus comes to have a conversation. But there's more going on here. If you would just look back a couple verses, look back at John chapter 2, verses 23. That's really going to set the stage for us of this conversation. So a couple of verses back, John 2, 23. It says, now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. So there's many that are, that are professing some kind of faith to Jesus because they see his signs, they see his miracles. But verse 24, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So you have the people believing in Jesus. Verse 24, it actually is the same word. He says, Jesus did not believe them. Jesus does not actually accept their testimony because he knows what's in them. This is a, a professed faith at an external level, but not, not heart faith. This is not actual belief in Jesus. This is just acknowledging his signs, seeing that he's a miracle worker, seeing that he's doing these mighty acts, and saying, yeah, I want to follow that guy. Jesus is the, the popular guy at this point. He's popular, right? He's on the scene. He's doing mighty things. So the people are following him in droves. Not because they, they love Jesus and his words, but, but because he's a celebrity at this point. You look forward a couple chapters in John 6. We're going to see after Jesus feeds the 5,000 that he calls the people to submit to his teaching and many turn away from him, many stop following. Once he calls them to submit, to actually obey his voice, they, they turn away. They just want the, the food, they want a full stomach. They want the bread, the physical bread, but they don't want his words. So we have this setting at the end of chapter two, where Jesus, where, where the apostle John tells us that Jesus is not entrusting himself to these men. There's a, a false profession going on, an acknowledgement of Jesus miracles, but not his teaching. So then you have Nicodemus come on the scene. Really, it's the next, you know, the next section here right in this passage, uh, really to set the stage for us. What's going on with Nicodemus? Well, now Jesus is going to address this false belief, this belief that just centers around the miracles and the signs, but not actually believing his teaching. So Nicodemus here gets to be a, a guinea pig of sorts. He gets to be an example for us as Jesus confronts this non-believing crowd. Look what Nicodemus says in verse 2. In verse 2, he says, We know you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do. It's the same word here. Nicodemus acknowledges the signs. He acknowledges there's something going on here from heaven. So it's worthy of having a conversation. It's almost like Nicodemus is, is asking Jesus to validate himself to Nicodemus. You notice Nicodemus doesn't ask a question. He doesn't ask Jesus anything. He just greets Jesus, and then immediately Jesus goes straight for the heart. He goes straight for the issue here. Jesus is going after false religion. He is going after man-made religion. He knows what is in man. Jesus knows what Nicodemus believes, and he's going to expose it. And here Jesus, in one phrase, crushes Pharisaic Judaism. He is not going to have a, a friendly dialogue on Nicodemus's terms, not just two scholars talking about ideas. He tells Nicodemus his fundamental problem with one statement, Jesus shatters man-made religion. See, the Pharisees have taken God's good instruction and they have made it about externals. You know, do this, pray this prayer, walk this many steps on this day, do this thing and you'll get into heaven. The rabbinical teachings of the day affirmed that Jews would be admitted into the kingdom as long as they didn't apostatize or commit some kind of extraordinary wickedness. So as long as they didn't reject Judaism, as long as they externally observed the Mosaic laws, and as long as they didn't do anything really evil, they didn't murder maybe, they could get into the kingdom God made promises to Abraham. He made promises to David. They know that there's a kingdom coming. So the Jews, the Pharisees are teaching, you will get into this kingdom if you are a Jew and you just obey these rules. And they're thinking, we're Abraham's children. We have been born from Abraham. So we're going to get in the kingdom. 
And then verse three, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus says the only way to be part of God's kingdom is new birth, to be born a second time. He is saying to Nicodemus that you being a Jew will not get you into God's kingdom. You don't have automatic access because of your Jewish birth. Not because you're a Jew, not because you're a son of Abraham. He says you must have new birth. You must be born again. You need something to happen to you that you can't do for yourself. Jesus is saying there is no self-righteousness that can come into God's kingdom, no man-made standard. Where you were born, your status, money, fame, influence, none of these things will get you in. You must have change on the inside. And really he's telling Nicodemus that you are not part of God's kingdom. You are not part of God's family. That your religious devotion will not save you. So here Jesus shatters man-made religion, any false religion, any easy believism, anyone that wants a checklist, I'm going to do this on my terms, I'm going to work harder, I'm going to earn this, I want to do something that I can touch and feel to get me in. All right, man-made religion, our own heart is going to tell us that we're pretty good. We just need to do, try a little harder, do more good than bad. But Jesus here comes along and says, no, if you would get into God's kingdom, you have to have something done to you. You must have God's spirit change you on the inside. So Jesus here is preaching man's inability. God's sovereignty and man's inability. And we must preach this message as you think about evangelism. As you think about children in the home, they need to hear this message. They need to be reminded that going to church on Sunday, showing up at an equipping hour, going to student ministries, following the rules, getting good grades, being a good kid, having Christian parents, none of these things will save you. You have to be born again. They must believe. And Jesus here, he... He just holds high God's sovereignty, and he holds, he holds low man's ability. Man is unable. Inherent in this command is that man cannot save himself. He doesn't possess any goodness on his own. Jesus is saying, you are not good. In this command to be born again, he is saying, you have no ability to save yourself. You don't have the solution. You are part of the problem. You see, Jesus preaches the bad news first. He says, you are part of the problem, not part of the solution. And people need to hear this message. They need to see that they, they need God to do something to them. This passage does not fit with any false religion. Any false religion, Mormonism, Catholicism, Islam, does not teach a message of, of regeneration, change at a heart level. Think about Mormonism. You turn eight years old, you're baptized into the church, confirmed as part of God's family at a certain age with a certain right. In this passage, Jesus would say, no, you must be born again. Not on a birthday, not where you're born, not doing a certain religious duty, but God actually saving sinners. And we'll see next how Nicodemus responds to this. It's going to bring us to the, the second section here. Nicodemus' response, he says, how can a man be born when he is old? He doesn't understand. So Jesus is going to explain the new birth to him. So secondly, Jesus is going to give him the, the requirement of repentance. As Jesus unfolds this evangelistic command to be born again, first he teaches the inability of man, and now he's going to teach the requirement of repentance. What is the new birth? What does this look like? Verses 4 through 6. Nicodemus said to him, verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So Nicodemus here is confused. He doesn't understand. 
And Jesus is going to explain to him what this new birth is. So verse 3, he says, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now in verse 5, Jesus says, you must be born of water and the spirit to see the kingdom of heaven. So this new birth, being born again, means being born of water and being born of the spirit. That's what it means to be born again. So we're going to look at these two. What is water and the spirit? I think the spirit is, is pretty obvious. The, the Holy Spirit this is a work of God. You must be born from God. God must do this work. This is divine regeneration. God bringing the spiritually dead to life. Those who are dead in their sins, unable to save themselves, God must bring them to life. This is God's work. He saves. He makes alive. So he says you must be born of the Spirit, but you also must be born of water. We have to look back in our context to understand what, what's going on here when he uses this word water. So if you would turn back a page to, to John 1, 23, John chapter 1, verse 23, we have John the Baptist on the scene here. John the Baptist is, is preaching a message to the people. Verse 23, John the Baptist says, I am the voice of one crying. Verse 26, John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the one whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. So here, this word water, John is baptizing in water. If you turn to verse 32, sorry, verse 31 of chapter one, verse 31, John the Baptist says, I did not recognize him but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, he is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So we see John use this phrase, baptizing with water, this baptism of John, this is the, the people being prepared for the Messiah, uh, recognizing their need, recognizing their sin, a uh, proselyte baptism in the, in the Jewish culture. Before Jesus in the Old Testament, you had proselytes, people that are coming to be part of God's kingdom, God's family, the covenant people, Israel. They would be baptized. They'd be washed with water. This was a, an acknowledgement that they were unclean an acknowledgement that they were outside of God's covenant family, and they wanted to be brought into this family. So they would baptize proselytes in water, signifying that they, need, they needed cleansing. That's what John is doing here. His baptism with water is, is the people acknowledging they need to be cleansed. They're actually acknowledging, the Jews who are being baptized by John are acknowledging that they're actually outside of God's covenant because of their sin, because of their hard-heartedness. So to be baptized by John the Baptist was to say, I've actually rebelled against God in my heart. I need to be baptized. I need to be cleansed. It's an acknowledgement of sin. This is repentance. This is agreeing with God that at a heart level, they had, they had rebelled against him, that they needed new birth. They're acknowledging that they're not going to get into God's kingdom based on being ethnic Jews. They're saying they need a heart change. This is what John preached. So the people that are baptized with water are, are repenters. They're ones who agree with God. They, they admit that they're unclean because of their sin. They view themselves as guilty before the Lord. So this is repentance, preparing the way for Messiah. And Nicodemus knows of John's baptism. In chapter 1, the Pharisees come to question John the Baptist. What John the Baptist is doing is obvious. The baptism with water the people know what's going on. Nicodemus knows what's going on. So when Jesus says, you must be baptized from water, Nicodemus knows he's talking about John's baptism. He's talking about this baptism of repentance, of acknowledging that you are unclean, that you need to be redeemed, you need to be cleansed. So what Jesus is saying when he says, you need to be born of water and the spirit, he's saying you, you need to repent, believe, and God must regenerate you. This is regeneration and repentance. 
these two realities. God must change you on the inside. The Spirit must make you alive. And you must repent and believe. We have d- human responsibility and divine sovereignty both on display here. God must do this work, and you must believe. You must repent. This is the prerequisite for entry into the kingdom. Repentance would be agreeing with God about sin. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So what Jesus is saying is you must turn away from everything you've made of yourself, every self-centered attempt to please the Lord. He is saying all of your own righteousness is filthy rags. You must turn to the Lord. In verse 6, he says, That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's saying that the flesh, man in his fallen condition, only produces flesh. He cannot save himself. Jeremiah 13 says, Can a leopard change its spots? Can a man who is evil become good on his own? No. This is the work of a spirit, of the spirit. New birth is required because we cannot go from being fleshly to being spiritual without God's spirit doing that work. So Jesus here is preaching this message of repentance and regeneration of the inward transformation evidenced by outward repentance. Next scene here in this unfolding of Jesus' evangelism, we saw the inability of man, the requirement of repentance, and now third, the prerogative of God, verses seven through nine. The prerogative of God. This is God's work. He does this work as he chooses. Look at verse seven through nine here. Jesus says, do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes and from where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus here is going to use wind as an example of the, the new birth of the Spirit's work in the heart of a believer. We can't control the wind. We can't stop the wind. Jesus says here, we don't know where the wind is coming from or where it's going. If you've driven from here to San Diego, you see the, the sea of windmills before you get to San Diego. You know, we don't, we don't control the wind. We just harness its power. We can't direct it. We can't predict it. We can't see it. But Jesus here is saying this is not something that humans control. God is sovereign over salvation. That's what Jesus is saying here. The Spirit regenerates whomever he wills. We plant seeds, but God causes the growth. God gives, the, gives life. This is d- divine prerogative. This is God's choice, his grace. And that leaves us helpless, and it leaves us humble. Our salvation is not because we were smarter, we were wiser, we had better answers or better questions. It is simply because God showed grace. The wind blew where it would blow. We are beneficiaries of God's grace, not because of something we did, but because of something God did. And that's what people need to hear. That's what we need to hear. A high view of God, a low view of man. If people are going to, to repent, they need to come to the end of themselves. They need to see that they are the problem, that God is the solution. And Jesus here is giving a command that Nicodemus cannot keep. Right? You must be born again. You must have something done to you. But this forces the one who hears this command to cry out to God. To say, I'm unable to do this. God, would you save me? Would you do this work? Think about the, the man with a withered hand. Just Jesus giving commands to people that have no ability to keep these commands. When he says, stretch out your hand, the man with no hand stretches out his hand. He obeys the word of Jesus. When Jesus commands Lazarus, who is dead, to come forth, Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Jesus gives commands, and then he empowers the ability to keep these commands, to do this work. 
And again, we see Nicodemus' response, verse 9, how can this be? And Jesus says, verse 10, you are the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things. So the question for us as we hear that, is, is this a new concept? Should Nicodemus have known this? You know, Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel, you don't know this? Should he have known? Was the Old Testament clear that new birth is, is needed, is required? You have John the Baptist coming on the scene, preaching heart change, preaching a message of repentance, saying that people need to be cleansed. And sadly, in that day, it was a new message, but it wasn't a new message in the scripture. I'm just going to turn to a couple places. If you just look with me at Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel 36, we're going to see this new birth, this regeneration, heart change on the inside is all over the Old Testament. I'm just going to take you to a couple places. Ezekiel 36 verses 26. Ezekiel 36, 26. God is making future commands for his people when they're going to be restored to God's kingdom. And this is a promise that God gives in Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. See, Ezekiel 36 here, we see regeneration, God giving a new heart requirement for those that would come to him, that would believe him, that would obey him. They must have a new heart. This isn't a new teaching. If you would turn to Psalm 87 now. Psalm 87. I was uh, pointing to just, uh, there's a great uh, paper online, I think a uh, a seminar that Dr. Barrick out of the Master Seminary did on this, this psalm, uh, just as an indication of new birth in the Old Testament. So I just want to look at it really brief with you. Psalm 87, very short psalm uh, about a millennial kingdom, Jesus' return, his reign as king on the earth. Verse 1, his foundations, his foundation is in the, in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. So he's talking about Jerusalem. This is in the future. Jerusalem, where God's people are gathered, where the king reigns, where Messiah reigns as king. And then, and then in this passage, you're going to see a, a census taken in Jerusalem, a recording of the people who are there. Verse 4. I shall mention Rahab and Babylon among those who know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. This one was born there. So you have all these people from other nations that are coming to Jerusalem to be part of this kingdom. People from Babylon, from Ethiopia, from Philistia. All these different nations gathered. And now in verse 5, you have this, this census being taken of those in Jerusalem. But of Zion it shall be said, This one and that one were born in her. So he's saying of these people that have come from Babylon, that have come from Ethiopia, he's saying all of these people that were born in these other places, in this census in Jerusalem, they're saying they were born here. They were born in her. They were born in Jerusalem. There is a, an idea of a second birth here. Those coming from all these other nations are actually born of Jerusalem because that's where the king is. There is a, an idea of new birth here. I don't know if any of y'all are from Texas. I'm, I'm not from Texas, but people that are from Texas are really proud to be from Texas. Uh, I heard this joke that people from Texas don't ask other people where they're from because either they're already from Texas or they have to embarrass themselves and say that they're not from Texas. So you see this, this pride of where they're from. Where in, in this psalm, no one is saying when they're in Jerusalem, no one is saying, I'm from Texas. No one is proud of where they're from. They're saying, I'm from Jerusalem. They're saying, I'm from, I'm from Zion. They're saying, I was born a second time, and that's the country of my birth, where the king is. So you have this concept of new birth, being born from the Spirit in the Old Testament, 
Just one more place I want to look, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Think about Nicodemus being a teacher of the law. In the five books of Moses, the law, the Torah. Well, in the Torah, you have new birth. Deuteronomy 30, verses 5 and 6. God promises, he actually tells the people that they're going to rebel against him. They're going to be cast out into the nations. They're not going to keep his commands. They're going to be scattered. But then he also promises that they're going to be restored. They're going to come back. In this promise in Deuteronomy 30, verses 5 and 6, the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. This heart circumcision, that is regeneration. That is divine rebirth. That is a change on the inside. God changing his people on the inside so that they can obey him. So Jesus isn't preaching anything new. He is just decimating this man-made religion, this religion of, of works-based salvation, telling them that God has to save you. You must be regenerate. You have a little bit of a shift here in the, in the story. Jesus moves from, from talking about what man needs. He needs regeneration, repentance, and now what the response to this is. Now, how should you respond? How do I get this regeneration? We're going to see this next scene. Verses 10 through 13, the folly of unbelief. The folly of unbelief. Let's look back in John. Chapter 3. Verse, back in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus says, we speak of what we know. We testify of what we have seen. He, when he says we here, he's speaking of, of he and John the Baptist. They're both testifying simultaneously, preaching this message of repentance. And they testify what they know, he says. They, they know this truth. They've actually been given divine revelation. But they also testify what they have seen. It's actually clear. It's evident to them. It's evident to everyone what's going on here. You know, Nicodemus recognizes Jesus is from God, but is still not willing to, to give him the, the due, the authority of his teaching. So Jesus' miracles are okay for the people, but not his testimony, not his words. And the issue here is unbelief. Nicodemus doesn't believe what Jesus says. His teaching was clear, it was plain, it was evident. But Nicodemus doesn't believe it. There's not faith here in the words of Jesus. In verse 12, he says, I tell you earthly things and you do not believe. Jesus is saying that Nicodemus has a faith problem. He doesn't actually believe the words of Jesus. In verse 12, he says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will, I be how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus here in this verse is saying that Nicodemus doesn't understand the basics of salvation. He doesn't understand regeneration and repentance. He doesn't understand how a sinner is saved. This is the earthly thing. This is the most basic thing. This is fundamental to spiritual life. So he's saying, Nicodemus, you don't understand the foundational things. How could you be a teacher of Israel and not know this? How could you talk about heavenly things, he's saying? How could you talk about God's kingdom when you don't even know how someone gets into the kingdom? And the issue here is Nicodemus doesn't believe. He doesn't believe Jesus' words. Nicodemus is still trusting in himself, trusting in his own assessment, trying to, to interpret Jesus' miracles by his own reasoning. Jesus here doesn't say the problem is that you haven't been born again. 
That's not the problem. The problem isn't that he hasn't been born again. That's what he needs, right? He needs to be born again. But the problem, the, the reason is that Nicodemus doesn't believe. There's culpability here for Nicodemus because of his lack of faith. You don't believe, he says. And this is not God's fault. This is Nicodemus' fault. It was clear, it was evident, Jesus says, and you don't believe the words of Messiah. I had a conversation recently with, with someone who was uh, rejecting the faith, who had grown up in the church, and, and what they said in this conversation was, well, I, I asked God to save me. I prayed, God didn't do it, didn't change my heart, so I'm just gonna live for myself, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try something else. You know, if God wanted to save me, he could have, but he didn't. And you hear in this uh, an accusation against God, acting like it, this is God's fault. You know, ultimately, this individual doesn't believe God's word. They don't believe what God says, and now they're gonna hold God accountable on their terms to what would be more compelling to them. Here's how God should save me on my terms. This is the issue here for Nicodemus, is unbelief. So we see that God must regenerate and you must believe. In verse 13, Jesus says where this wisdom is found, the issue again, not believing Jesus' words, not believing God's wisdom that has been sent from heaven. He says in verse 13 that no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So he's saying no one has authority to go up to heaven. No one is able to actually go up to heaven to get God's words, to get wisdom from God, except for the one who has come down to you. Here's the one who has this authority, and he's actually in the midst of Nicodemus. God's truth, God's word is here on earth. Jesus is speaking in front of Nicodemus, and he still won't believe. This is just further condemnation of Nicodemus, the folly of his unbelief on display here, to have the Son of God who is standing in front of him, if that's not compelling enough, what other evidence would you need? What would be more compelling than the Son of Man standing in front of you? If that truth isn't compelling, there's nothing else for you. And that's going to move us to the next section here, from the, the folly of unbelief to Jesus now giving this gospel call uh, some of the sweetest words in the Bible. Jesus talks about the, the object of belief. The object of belief. We're going to see this in verses 14 through 17. We think about faith. I think a lot of times we hear people talk about faith as this feeling, kind of this touchy-feely, I have faith, I'm spiritual. I have faith in this hard situation. Well, Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to tell us that faith is not, is not a measure of, of our assessment of a, some kind of feeling, but actually is, is valid in the object that it is in, the object of belief. Faith is in a person. Right? It's not just a feeling. It's not just being spiritual. It's faith in Jesus, faith in the God-man. This is Jesus' evangelism. He's saying you must believe in Jesus. Put all of your hope in him. Verses 14 through 17. As Moses lifted up the in the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus here starts by talking about Moses in the wilderness, this flashback of a, of a snake being held up for the people. So this story is in Numbers 21. If you remember the story, God judges his people for their grumbling, for their unbelief. He sends poisonous snakes into the congregation of Israel while they're in the wilderness. And the people are bitten by these snakes. Many people are dying. There's judgment. But then God provides rescue. Numbers 21.8, just read to you quickly. The, the Lord said to Moses, 
make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. So you have Moses erecting this bronze serpent, and those who listen to God's voice, those who look up to his means of salvation, they will live. They will not die from this poison, from these snakes. So in this way, you must look up to Jesus. And the way that they looked up to the serpent, they looked up to God's means for salvation, you must look up to Jesus, God's only means of salvation. This exclusive message, only those who look to Jesus will be saved. That's what Jesus is teaching here. There is rescue here, but the rescue comes only through Christ, only through belief in him. And he says the Son of Man must be lifted up. This lifting up, this is lifted up in glory. He must be lifted up as king. He must be exalted. But we know where the story goes. We know that this lifting up as king goes through a cross. So you must look up to that one, the one who is bloody and beaten on a cross, who bore the full weight of the wrath of God for sin. That's the one that you must look up to for salvation. Put your faith in him for rescue. That's what Jesus is saying. There is one way to be saved. It is by exalting the king, the king who died. Then we get to John 3.16. One commentator says, Jesus sums up the gospel in one lovely sentence so rich in content that if man had only these words and nothing of the rest of the Bible, he could, by truly apprehending them, be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever would believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. The whole world, this conglomerate of the human race, not the physical planet, but mankind. God did not abandon man. Think about the, the demons, the fallen angels. There is no hope for them. There's no opportunity to repent. There's no hope for salvation. But for mankind, God provides salvation. He provides escape as a demonstration of his love. It's not because God looked down the corridor of time and said, man, that person, they are so lovely. I'm going to save that one. No, this is, this is centered in God because God is love. And he loved in this way. He loved to this extent that Christ would die for the ungodly. Those who didn't earn it, those who weren't lovely, that's God's demonstration of love. It's demonstrated by sending his one-of-a-kind son, his only son, the, the perfect triune God, perfect fellowship throughout eternity, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father now turning his face away from the Son, forsaking him, punishing him for sin. So in this evangelistic call, we hold high that message. Believe in that one. Believe in the one who on the cross bore the weight of God's wrath against sinners. That is a demonstration of love. And that's the heart of the, the message here. This object of faith, look to God's means of salvation. Believe in the Son for eternal life. This is the center of Jesus' evangelism. Believe in the Son. Verse 17, he says, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You might read that verse. If you stop right there, you might think, okay, so no judgment. The whole world is saved, everyone. Will you keep reading the next verse? No, we find out there are, there are those who are judged because of their unbelief. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, he's saying Jesus in his first advent, when he came the first time, did not come to judge the world, not yet. He came to save. He came to provide rescue. He came to deal with sins. And we're going to see in the next verse, he didn't come the first time to judge. He came to save. But we see there is a judgment here. There is, there is a judgment, an active judgment from God. It will be demonstrated in the future, but it is demonstrated today in unbelief. 
So last section here, verses 18 through 21, we see the outcome of unbelief. The outcome of unbelief, verses 18 through 21. He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe <clears throat> has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So Jesus says he did not come 2,000 years ago, the first time to judge. Not yet. But verse 18, we see that the one who does not believe is already judged. He is already standing condemned because of his unbelief. He is culpable. He is at fault here. Not God. God is not at fault. The one who will not believe is at fault. He is required to believe. When he says judged already, he is found to be at fault. This would be like a, if someone were to see a, a masterpiece painting, maybe to hear a symphony play, someone with no artistic background, no music background, to go to a symphony, to see an art piece and say, eh, it's not very good. Eh, I don't think they're very talented. Well, who's the one being judged there? Is it the one who is casting judgment on something they don't know? Or are they actually revealing themselves to be at lack? Is the symphony lacking? Or are they lacking? That's what's going on here, is the one who rejects the light, they're really demonstrating their own judgment. They're showing their own lack. It's not that the light is lacking. It's that they don't believe. The problem is with them. Verse 19, he says, this is the judgment. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. They demonstrate their hard-heartedness by their, by their lack of accepting the light, they demonstrate that they're, they're at fault, that there's actually this judgment, that they're actually required to believe, everyone is required to believe, and is now liable for not believing. There will be a, a future public judgment when Jesus returns to this earth. Before the watching world, there will be judgment. But here... <laughs> The gospel writer says that their judgment has already, has already been made. Those that reject Christ have already found themselves to be judged, to be condemned. They demonstrate themselves to be blind. See, the one who has rejected Christ, it is not because God is deficient, because they are deficient, because they don't believe. They don't see their sin. They don't see their need. We find out at the end of verse 19 that they love their sin that they love darkness rather than the light. Categorically evil in the inner man. They hate the light. This is, this is evil in, in affection, in actions. Like Jesus said earlier in this passage, that that which is born of flesh is flesh. They love darkness. They can't get out of the darkness unless God would rescue them. Verse 20 says, The one who loves darkness, this evildoer, does not come to the light because he doesn't want his deeds to be exposed. See, the light is going to reveal what he loves. Just like Jesus here reveals what Nicodemus loves, the truth of God reveals what's going on in the heart. Now, if any of you all have scorpions or have been scorpion hunting, you cast the black light, right, on the scorpion, and they just, they light up. You can see them across the yard. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of scorpion hunting, but... I've done it. Um, the reason I don't like it is because a lot of times you see the scorpion and then it crawls back behind the block wall. And now you know it's there. Didn't kill it. Harder to sleep at night. But that's what's going on here is the light reveals what's already there. It reveals what's behind the block wall of the heart. The evil that is there is now revealed by the light. There is guilt here for the unbeliever. They know God. They are accountable to God. 
Like Romans 1 says, they are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness because of a love for sin that they suppress the truth. They have a guilty conscience. As you think about evangelism, as you think about gospel witness in the world, other people's consciences, we know what's going on in their conscience. We don't have to guess that people are feeling guilt of sin. The Bible tells us that. We don't have to guess that they're afraid of death. God's word says they're afraid of death. You can appeal to the conscience. It's being exposed when the truth comes. When Jesus comes, the conscience is, is revealed. There is conviction. So they turn away from the light, though, instead of coming for rescue, because they love their sin. They don't want to turn away from it. But verse 21, last verse here, you have another group, the ones who practice the truth, the ones who come to the light. And they not only love the truth, they practice it. They do the truth. All right, this is genuine repentance and faith, those that have visible fruit, because they love the truth. So we see, we see Jesus here, God here saying that those who don't believe are guilty because they don't come, because they don't believe. But verse 21 is the ones who do come. It's not because of them. It says their deeds have been wrought by God. God gets the glory and salvation of sinners. He gives new birth. He brings a spiritual life. He produces fruit. God is on display when sinners embrace the gospel and repent. And we have these two truths in this passage, in this evangelism from Jesus. We have divine sovereignty. We have human responsibility, both displayed. God is completely sovereign over salvation. The wind blows where it wishes. And man is responsible, responsible for his unbelief, condemned for not believing, culpable. We must hold both of these realities high. Man is responsible to believe, and God is sovereign over salvation. Jesus doesn't see a need here to, to remove this tension that we might have. He says, you must be born again, and he says, you must believe. God must change you, and you must believe. And you are accountable if you don't believe. Spurgeon, there's a, a quote from an uh, encounter with Charles Spurgeon where someone asked him, how do you reconcile these two doctrines? that God saves sinners, and that men perish by their own fault. And he says, I never reconcile friends. They're both in God's word, so I shall not attempt to reconcile them. You think about evangelism, we need both of these truths. We need to trust God completely, his power in salvation, his prerogative, his initiative, and we must call sinners to repent, to believe. We must persuade and explain. They're required to believe. They're responsible to believe. And God is sovereign. We can't be cold, impassionate, just think, well, God will save. I'll just leave it up to God. Right, that would be unfaithful. That would be prideful. That would be loveless. We must have both. We must not have a man-centered gospel that says, let's try to convince them, compel, manipulate, with whatever we can to get them to believe. And we have confidence that God saves sinners. We just cast the seed. We faithfully plant seed, the same seed over and over, and we just see what God does. Spurgeon in this, uh, in this quote goes on to say, O sinners, if you perish, on your own head must be your doom. Conscience tells you this. The word of God confirms it. You shall not be able to lay your condemnation at any man's door but your own. If you are damned, it shall be your own fault. If you are found in hell, your blood shall be on your own head. You shall bring the wood to your own burning, and you shall dig the iron for your own chains, and on your own head will be your doom. But if you are saved, it cannot be by your merits. It must be by grace, free, sovereign grace. The gospel is preached to you, and it is this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. As I uh, had that conversation with my five-year-old about saving faith, okay, what do I have to do? What do I have to say? And I told him, you must be born again. And you probably know what the next question was. 
okay, Dad, how do I get born again? What do I do to be born again? He said, you must believe. You must cry out in humble faith. You must see your need. You must see that your only hope comes from outside of yourself. God must change your heart. And you must believe. You pray with me. God, we just thank you for the truth, the clarifying truth of your word. I pray that we would be those who are eager and bold to uphold your clear word, Lord. I pray that it would impact hearts and lives, those around us, as we are quick to bring the truth of your gospel, that you save sinners, that you are reconciling sinners to yourself, Lord. I pray that we would be ambassadors for reconciliation, Pray that we would hold your sovereignty, your goodness, your good control of all things up high. And I pray that we would be eager to compel sinners to believe that we would persuade with your words, Lord, because we love others and we love you, Lord, and we want your glory to be manifested throughout this world. Pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.